Hello, my name is Nicole, and today I would like to share with you some information dealing with tithes and offerings. I know that some of you all, sometimes you have this feeling that creeps up on the inside of you when somebody asks you for anything, whether it's in the church or outside the church, that leaves you feeling upset, angry, sad, frustrated, and for some of you who are not saved, sanctified, and Holy Ghost filled, ready to cuss somebody out. So, Basically, today I would like to address this uh, issue of tithes and offerings in such a way that is very real and very true. Um, I have had personal experience, both good, bad, and otherwise, concerning giving, and that is why I feel led to share with you this information today as the Lord uh, speaks. So, let me jump right on in. Um, first of all, we hear about tithing when we're watching television. Uh, televangelists will tell you various things um, about tithing. One particular scripture they will typically use is this one out of Luke chapter 6, verse 38. I will give and it will be given unto me. Good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into my bosom. With the same measure that I give, it will be measured back to me. This scripture is usually used just after they've asked you to give so much money, then they will basically tell you that there's a return on your investment when you give, and they usually use this scripture. Another one is Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward me, that always, having all sufficiency in all things, I may have an abundance for every good work. Once again, this scripture is often used. Um, another one, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 8. If I diligently obey the voice of the Lord, all these blessings shall come upon me and overtake me. I will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. I will be blessed when I come in and blessed when I go out. The Lord will command a blessing on my storehouses and in all to which I set my hand. And he will bless me in the land which the Lord my God is giving me. The Lord says that, once again, these are manipulations of the scriptures, basically telling you to give so that they can get more. And then, of course, making you feel good about your giving by taking the word and comforting you. OK, I'm hearing manipulation all through my spirit right now. And the Lord is angry um, at ministers who do this. Um, another scripture, Malachi chapter three, verse 10, I will bring all my tithes into the storehouse and the Lord will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing for me. Now, back in the day, storehouses were basically places where uh, food was stored, meat, things of that sort. Um, but nowadays, ministers will take storehouse and turn that whole word around and say church, uh, specifically their buildings and uh, the Lord says that when we're giving, we're giving uh, to people. We're not giving so much to buildings. So what happens is, is that let's say that there is a need that comes up in the church regarding the building. Uh, rather than just stating that we need X amount of dollars to get this done or that done, some will use this scripture to hide the need because the need, the money is not really going toward the need so to speak. It's really going uh, to pay people's salaries and things of that sort. And the Lord says that they will use his name to cover up where the money is really going. Um, if these churches were more forthright and more truthful about um, where the money was going, then people would not hesitate and you wouldn't see a fluctuation in uh, the finances. But uh, those people um, unfortunately, worship leaders and um, ministers and, and pastors' wives and so on and so forth will um, hide behind these scriptures um, to, uh, to basically get the things that they want. Um, clothing, uh, pay car notes, pay mortgages and things of that sort. And yes, of course, the minister of God uh, should be uh, blessed to some capacity. But what is happening is when uh, the church finances are short, they're still taking their money off the top when that shouldn't be. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, more in terms of uh, some scriptures. Okay, now another scripture that is used is Proverbs chapter 8 um, and uh, it's verse 21. You cause those who love you to inherit wealth and you will fill their treasuries. 
So that, of course, um, is one that will once again, a feel good message um, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. So I ask in prayer, believing and I know I will receive. So, of course, you know, you've got to feel good about your giving. You've got to believe that something good is going to come of your giving to a man or a woman um, or a company. So therefore, uh, this is what they will uh, remind you of. And uh, another one is James chapter four, verse two. And that's I do not have because I do not ask. So that's another good one, too, that can be, um, unfortunately, not can be, but is used. Um, and what they'll do is um, basically say, put the blame on you. Um, the reason why, you know, you can't get your rent paid because um, you don't give. Um, you should be giving consistently. If you gave consistently, you could get your rent paid. You wouldn't have to worry about borrowing from this person and that person. But the truth of the matter is, is that... Um, a person who already doesn't have much money, they have already um, budgeted out all their finances. Um, it's not an issue of uh, because they didn't give to the church is the reason why they're short on their rent. Um, usually it's because they, you know, had an unexpected expense that came up and they and it needed to be their their bills needed to be met. So this issue of um, putting guilt trips on people and blaming them um, and saying that maybe God is not with them and things of that sort because they don't give money. That's absolutely ridiculous. But our people and some that are listening right now are in bondage because of this. Um, the Lord is not that kind of God. The one true God in the Bible is not that kind of God. He is not going uh, to tell you that the reason why um, you are coming up short um, when it comes to getting your rent paid and, and food, um, uh, you know, um, being bought in your home and things of that sort is because um, you're not giving enough to the church. If anything, he would say, no, I think you need to stop giving to the church and meet the needs of your family. And then once you've got all of those things taken care of, then let's sit down and let's start talking about, you know, uh, giving me first fruits. God is a compassionate God, and there are scriptures that will back that up. So let's get into um, the scriptures that um, all other scriptures that they use uh, churches. But this time, what I'm going to do is is focus on those scriptures um, in such a way that will deliver people from this um, um, in the box type of thinking um, where it's just strictly all about the church and about that man who keeps telling you, you need to give, give, give. OK, first of all, I must say that God does bless us with concepts. You know, um, he gives me ideas and I say, OK, I've got to go ahead. I've got to do these things. He blesses ministers, leaders, teachers, you know, you name it with various concepts. And so sometimes the concepts are expensive. And one thing about it, if God gives you a concept, he's going to make sure that you have all the necessary um, material to go ahead and uh, get that concept um, uh, in reality, uh, make it a, a known fact that, yes, it's, it's going to be here. It's going to be um, a building. If it's if it's that kind of concept, it's going to be a book. It's going to be a, a job. It's going to be um, whatever it is. He's going to make sure that you have the necessary supplies to get you know, uh, there from here. But what happens is sometimes we've got ministers that have so many different concepts and they're not all about God's business. Um, they may say that it's about God's business. You might even see in a blueprint, um, crosses and so forth. And you might even read about what's going to take place within that, uh, uh, concept. But the thing is, is that, um, when God blesses us with these ideas, um, he is going to make sure that we have all that we need. Now, when you see a minister is struggling, you know, year after year after year, you forgot to wonder, you know, what exactly is going on here? Um, is it that this minister has enough already and he just wants more and he just wants to um, build more uh, money so that he can get more things for his family? Um, is this because he's ego tripping? Um, you know, there's a lot of things that ministers will uh, branch out and do and say that God told them to when, in fact, God didn't tell them anything like it. Their wife told them um, their cousin told them um, they saw something on television. They read something in a magazine and they say, yeah, maybe this will be good for the church. Um, 
the church is not supposed to carry their burdens, um, their their big concepts, their big ideas um, when they already have enough things going on. Um, the, the idea is to manage what you already have and then branch out once you have everything managed accordingly and there's there's money uh, flow overflowing, then you can go ahead and start building up other things. Um, but unfortunately, there are too many people, far too many people that are in ministries that are not listening. And then before long, their churches are closed um, minist- or uh, members are leaving and it just becomes a big old fiasco. Um, and, and then because the ministers embarrassed having told everybody that this was a God idea, um, then he starts uh, placing the, the blame game on his members and saying they're not giving enough money. They um, aren't doing this. They're not doing that because he has to cover up the fact that he really didn't hear from the Lord and it was really his ego talking. Okay. So, Let's get into uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 14, verses 22, um, and uh, we'll read to 20, 25. Okay, be sure to set aside a tenth if all that your fields produ- produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. So back in those days, if you couldn't get to the church, then that's when you, you know, uh, had uh, took your money. And um, you could either uh, go ahead and and make a purchase uh, with it. And it goes on. Um, Back then, um, they used the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. That does not say take your silver and give it to the man and feed his house. Okay? See, so you're not going to hear a long sermon about that. Um, And then... Uh, there is another part of that scripture that says, "Then uh, and do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. So back in those days, um, there was an um, there was an organized way of tithing um, and offering. And when people didn't have uh, a place within their destination to go to worship the Lord, then they went and they took their monies and they bought things um, to, you know, take care of their family. Um, in the NIV study Bible, those scriptures are explained like this, uh, more specifically, uh, verses 22 and 23. The Bible makes the purpose of tithing very clear to put God first in our lives. We are to give God the first and best of what we earn. For example, what we do first with our money shows what we value most. Giving the first part of our paycheck to God immediately focuses our attention on him. It also reminds us that all we have belongs to him. A habit of regular tithing can keep God at the top of our priority list and give us a pros- a proper perspective on everything else we have. So basically, you're just getting your mind in training, you know, to uh, just value the Lord. Um, we value money. We know that money does various things to help us. And so what the Lord is doing is he's basically reconditioning your mind um, in such a way that instead of looking at money as, you know, the, the great um, most important thing um, that you need to survive, he wants to want you to start thinking in terms of him being the great thing and the thing that or not great thing, but great spirit um, that you need to help you survive. So that's all that is. It's not meant to be um, made a spectacle of this whole issue of giving to the Lord. Um, He just simply wants you to um, remind yourself each time with the thing that you value the most, which in in that case is money um, to, uh, you know, give to the, the, um, to his business, you know, those, um, things that are going on, um, that are related to, uh, the Lord. Um, and it's not always about money and, uh, there's other ways of giving. You can give time, you know, it's the first part of your day. You can dedicate that time to the Lord. Maybe it's a project that you can work on. 
Um, maybe it's a uh, service to a particular uh, ministry. Maybe it's just conversation with someone at the first part of your day. You decided I'm just going to share the gospel with someone who I, I really feel the Lord has laid on my heart who needs a word from the Lord. Um, the Lord also uh, can use your talents. Uh, maybe something that you're doing for a secular company, he can take that uh, talent of yours and uh, use you to be a blessing to other people with it. So there's various ways. It's not always this business about money, money, money. Um, but when you get to a place where you are more mature in Christ and you know that you just want to do something um you know, just great for the Lord and you know, it's going to cost money, then by all means, you're going to do that. And there's no requirement, this business of 10%. Um, it does say, be sure to set aside a 10th of all that your fields produce each year. Back in those days, that is what was commanded was a 10th. Um, nowadays, and you know, you can just pray and ask the Lord. Um, Jesus left the Holy Spirit behind. So you can contact the Holy Spirit, ask him what it is that you should be giving because he knows your finances better than you do. Okay, so moving on, um, we have uh, some scriptures that also talk about um, tithing and giving and all that. So let me get um, to that place. But before I do, let me get into the history um, of other ways that um, the believers in Deuteronomy gave. Um in chapter 16, verse, uh, verses 16 through 17, we read three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose at the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of weeks and the feast of tabernacles. No man should appear before the Lord empty handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. So back then they had events and uh, those events, people showed up and they gave. And basically nowadays, the same thing happens. You go to some type of spiritual event um, from weddings to um, revival meetings. You don't show up in empty handed. The Lord expects you to give something. It, it's just how it is um, because you know that it costs money to um, promote events, um, to make sure that everybody is comfortable at an event. So it's just common sense. I mean, you just make sure that you have some money with you when you show up and a lot of these events, they um, don't accept debit cards. So make sure you've got cash in hand. Okay. Um, another scripture is in Deuteronomy 17. And it's uh, verse uh, 22. It says, do not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep that has any defect or flaw in it. For that would be detestable to him. So back in those days, they gave animals, of course, um, as a sacrifice to the Lord. Nowadays, what uh, we do is we give all sorts of things away. We give appliances, we give clothes, we give bedding, um, we give uh, shoes, um, computers, you, you name it. We're giving something away um, to an organization, to an individual. Now, let me just tell you, the Lord doesn't want you giving defective things away. That's, oh, I'm, if I give this away, I'm going to be blessed. You're not going to get blessed for a defective item that you're giving to somebody if you know it has a short in it. You know, if you know that um, um, the, the hem of, of the garment is, is tacky. Um, if you know that it's an item where um, it, it's just broken and... Um, you know that the person is not in a position that they are really handy when it comes to fixing things. So that sort of thing, the Lord doesn't, if you're giving to his people or you're giving to um, uh, an organization that has been God inspired, you don't want to give defective stuff. Believers should know better. So if it's something that you think, well, maybe somebody could use it or they could fix it or what have you, then, OK, then maybe you want to give it to an organization that, you know, they have the, the people that are around that can fix it. But if it's an individual and, you know, this person really doesn't even have the money to get the computer fix that you are giving them or, you know, that. Um, you could be putting their family at risk by giving them something that has a short in it. You don't do that. You don't do that. Okay, so um, 
moving on, um, let's uh, go to let's go to uh, Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter thirty-one, and here uh, Hezekiah is uh, is um, giving orders out to his people. Um, let's see, verse four. He ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, oil, and honey, and all that the fields produced. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. What I really uh, focused on in this scripture was the part where he's, uh, uh, where it says, so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. There, he ordered these people to give so that those that were about God's business could be able to handle his business comfortably, without worry. And when you know somebody is out here um, or, you know, within your own family and they're doing some things related to God's business, it makes sense to give. It makes sense to give to their um, to, to uh, their organization or, you know, to their hobby or whatever it is that they're doing. That's God inspired. Um, in the NIV study Bible, it says Hezekiah reinstated the practice of tithing because at one point they didn't have it, giving a tenth of one's income to the priests and Levites so they could be free to serve God and minister to the people. The people responded immediately and generously. God's work needs the support of God's people. Does God receive a regular percentage of your income? So um, when you're out there and you're doing all these things for the Lord, you know, and I know that there is no, uh, serious income that comes from giving books away, giving uh, toys away, uh, giving anything away to anyone. There's there's nothing to um, be gained um, monetary, monetarily. Um, so that's why you need people that are going to support you on these uh, things that God lays on your heart. Um, you need people to contribute stamps. You need people to contribute um um, monies to buy ink cartridges, um, you know, if you're in a publishing business, uh, monies to help you um, if you're the type that travels here and there, gas money, um, you know, you need people that's going to uh, be behind you and uh, support you on these things. So here we are uh, with that particular scripture, that one was a, was a good one for somebody out there because you know, you, you need that support system behind you. And, uh, you might want to come up with, uh, a letter in the mail, uh, for someone for, or for a group and tell them what you're doing and let them know that, uh, you need some, uh, donations. Okay. That whole, uh, scripture that I told you earlier, earlier about I do not have because I do not ask in James chapter 4 verse 2 it's time for you to start asking it's time for you to start asking those of you who are about God's business okay so 2nd Corinthians chapter 8 verses 7 through 8 but just as you excel in everything in faith in speech in knowledge in complete earnestness and in your love for us see that you also excel in this grace of giving I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. So Paul was trying to um, encourage these people to give. And um, basically, that's a good way to test whether or not somebody really should be in your circle um, when it comes to uh, God's business. If they can put their money where their mouth is, then you know that they are definitely about uh, supporting your uh your God inspired concept. But if they don't, then you know that that's one less person that you need in your camp. Um, we, we have to realize that when we're walking this walk, that there are going to be times where the Lord is going to take us completely off course. Um, we may have invested some money in something already and thought that the Lord was behind it. And then we find out that he really wasn't behind it. So, before long, he takes us off course, and now we've got to get these people to rally behind us in what it is uh, that uh, the Lord wants done. Um, so 
you want to test these spirits around you. You want to see if they're sincere. Um, and then you want to uh, compare their sincerity um, with, you know, those other ones within your group. And in Paul, it, it, he was very wise in what he did. Um, and when he couldn't do something, he made sure that he had people around him that would go out there and, um, sp you know, spread the gospel and do the things that the Lord wanted done. So when you're organizing, um, those of you who are organizers, here's a word from the Lord. When you're organizing, make sure that you test everybody before you get out there and start really going, you know, 100% full strength. Uh, with your with your project that God has inspired you to do, because if you can weed the the weeds out early, then it's best to do that before you get too deep into the project. Now, uh, in chapter eight, verse twelve, it says, "For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have." And I like that because sometimes we put too much pressure. Um, on people to give. Um, sometimes um, we experience pressure to give. And if you don't have it, God is not going to sit there and say, well, you know what? I curse you because you don't have it. Man will. Man will get up in front, get up on the pulpit and tell everybody that that's why they're not getting what they they uh, really want in life and their prayers aren't getting answered and all that. That's bondage. That's bondage. And some of you all, you are being delivered right now because you needed somebody to just tell you, guess what? All of what's happening to you right now is not about your not being able to give. You couldn't give because you had your debt that you had to pay off. You couldn't give because you have a child that's in college right now. You couldn't give because right now you have somebody who's disabled in your household. And you every time you get a little bit of money, it has to go towards their issues. So God is not going to curse you for that. OK, that's just ridiculous that there are ministers out here that say these crazy things to people. So just know that God has your back. If nobody else has your back, God does. And forget what these shysty ministers say. OK, so um, in the study Bible for uh, chapter eight, verse 12 um, in Second Corinthians, it says, how do you decide how much to give? What about differences in the financial resources Christians have? Paul gives the Corinthian church several principles to follow. Number one, each person should follow through on previous promises. So if you promise somebody something, do it. Number two, each person should give as much as he or she is able. That means that if you are sitting there and you know all you have is $10, then you give $10. Forget what that minister said about giving a hundred dollars and you'll get blessed. Mm -hmm. OK, so moving on, because I don't want to take up time talking about that. Um, number three, each person must make up his or her own mind how much to give. And number four, each person should give in proportion to what God has given him or her. God gives us gives to us so that we can give to others. OK, so you got that. All right. Now in second Corinthians chapter nine, verses uh, six through eight is remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And I don't need to go any further with that because you all know that it's just like a, a a person who is a farmer, you know, you sprinkle those seeds out there, you're going to get a garden full of a whole bunch of wonderful, whatever it was that you sprinkled out. And if you didn't, don't sprinkle anything out, you know that you don't have a garden. So that's self-explanatory. Praise the Lord. OK, so um, please listen to uh, part two of this audio on tithing. And thank you for listening.